Hi, uh, viewers. Today uh, we will be going to discuss about uh, the introduction to spectroscopy, uh, wherein which we will be understanding uh, the terms that are involved in spectroscopy and what are the theories that were put forward in order to understand the properties of electromagnetic radiations. And we will be also studying the range or the wavelength regions of different electromagnetic radiations and what we mean by electromagnetic radiations and uh, we will take up the basic introduction to any uh, uh, general spectroscopic instruments what are the components that in a spectroscopic instrument has so in order to begin with uh, we will first define uh, what is spectroscopy or what is the uh, the use of this spectroscopy so spectroscopy is a branch of science that deals with study of interaction of electromagnetic radiations with matter and I will come to what we mean by electromagnetic radiations in the subsequent slides but spectroscopy is that branch of science or analytical science which deals with the study of interactions of electromagnetic radiations with any given matter. So uh, what happens uh, when the electromagnetic radiation uh, falls uh, on the matter what basically happens with that matter the most important thing uh, or the change that this electromagnetic radiations bring about when it falls uh, on any given matter is that the energy uh, since the electromagnetic radiations is a form of energy this form of energy or the electromagnetic radiation when it falls on the matter the, the energy is absorbed or emitted by the matter that is a very important thing that any matter uh, has by nature. So uh, the energy that is absorbed or emitted by this matter which is in a very discrete amount uh, is measured. That measurement uh, is a basic thing what we do in spectroscopy. And this absorption uh, or the emission processes uh, they happen all throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum ranging from the gamma region or uh, up till the radio uh, radio frequency region this effect of absorption and emission process is seen throughout the entire region of electromagnetic radiations uh, so basically what we do is in this spectroscopy uh, the measurement of frequencies uh, is done experimentally and it gives a value for the change of energy involved and from this one will draw the conclusion about the set of possible energy levels that the matter has. So that is the information uh, that this spectroscopy basically gives when this electromagnetic radiation interacts with the given matter and when it interacts with the given matter there is either an absorption or emission process that is happening and with the measurement of this either absorption or emission process uh, there is a change in energy that is involved and with this change in the energy we can uh, see to it that or uh, we can get an insight uh, with, uh, into the chemical or the physical properties of any given chemical system so that uh, we can draw a conclusion about the discrete energy levels that are existing in any given matter. So. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a technique that uses the interaction of energy, energy in the form of electromagnetic radiations, which is made to fall on the sample where there is either an absorption or emission. And if you carefully measure what is happening with the sample, we can get an insight upon uh, what is the chemical or the physical uh, uh, status of any given chemical system. So that is a broad idea what we mean by uh, spectroscopy. So once we perform uh, or when we subject a matter uh, to any given electromagnetic radiation uh, as, an, uh, uh, as an analyst I end up having this something called as a spectrum and this spectrum is a data that is obtained from the entire spectroscopic measurement and this spectrum is usually a plot of intensity of energy that is detected versus the wavelength of the energy. So what we are trying to measure in the spectrum is the wavelength 
of the energy or the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation is plotted versus the uh, energy or the intensity of the energy that is either absorbed or either emitted. If you plot across these two things, then we end up having something called as spectrum. So, this spectrum uh, is an interface uh, between uh, an analyst and the matter where in which we can get an insight into the matter just by looking onto the spectrum. And this spectrum will speak about the electronic status, the energy levels or whether it is a sort of a different different functional groups or what kind of uh, bonds, so on and so forth. We get a lot of information just by going through these kind of spectrums. So, the electromagnetic spectrum is a minute, uh, I'll be talking about this electromagnetic spectrum, what we uh, understand by this electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is a minute part of much large, larger continuum of electromagnetic waves arranged according to frequency and wavelength. So, the entire uh, range over which the electromagnetic radiation exists, uh, we call it as an electromagnetic spectrum and that larger continuum, if I am taking a small minute part out of it, out of the larger continuum of the electromagnetic radiations, I call that as the electromagnetic spectrum. So, this electromagnetic spectrum covers an immense range of wavelength and I will come to that uh, electromagnetic spectrum or that particular image uh, right down in the subsequent slide and they are arranged according to the frequency and wavelength. I mean to say either in increasing order of energy or either decreasing order of energy. So just to give an example, uh, the rainbow uh, is a seven colored uh, thing uh, which we get uh, during the rainy season and this rainbow is basically the splitting up of the white light into seven different colors. So those seven different colors uh, I call that as an electromagnetic spectrum or a visible spectrum wherein which that visible spectrum is made up of several different frequencies uh, or I can call them as wavelength as well so that this rainbow appears as a seven different colors. So prism does that particular job of splitting a white light into the component light. So that rainbow colors I call it as an electromagnetic spectrum and that rainbow color is just a minute part of the big much bigger continuum of electromagnetic waves. So those waves they are arranged in order like uh, order of energy uh, starting from gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible rays, infrared, uh, microwaves and radio waves. I will uh, speak about this electromagnetic spectrum in the subsequent slide. So why do we call it as uh, electromagnetic? What is the reason uh, of uh, calling that radiation as an electromagnetic radiation? So before we go uh, into that detail, first we will see uh, what were the theories uh, that were put forward in order to understand uh, uh, the visible light or the nature of the visible light. There were basically two theories that were put forward. The first one was the wave theory and the second one was uh, the corpuscular theory. Though they were uh, explained by these two different theories, uh, we believe that electromagnetic radiation is said to have the both the particle nature, a corpuscular theory is the particle theory. In other words, uh, the, the wave uh, behaves as a, uh, the electromagnetic radiation behaves as a wave as well as particle. So though the uh, light was described by these two uh, complementary theories, uh, we, we, we expect the electromagnetic radiation uh, uh, to have uh, the dual nature where it exhibits both the wave as well as the particle characteristics. So uh, we all know that uh, electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy. Uh, as I said, that is transmitted through the uh, space at enormous velocity. So, electromagnetic radiation requires uh, no supporting media. In fact, uh, it, uh, it tra traverses or it travels uh, uh, more readily in the vacuum region uh, rather in uh, supporting medium such as air uh, in contrast to uh, the sound uh, which do require a supporting medium. But, uh, uh, electromagnetic radiations do not need any supporting medium, rather they travel much faster in the vacuum region. 
and as i mentioned the electromagnetic radiation is said to have uh, both the nature that is wave nature as well as the particle nature uh, and this wave nature or the particle nature is not confined only to the visible portion but rather it can be extended to the entire electromagnetic um, uh, spectrum uh, and this uh, dual nature uh, is quite useful for quantitative description of uh, many phenomena uh, what we observe uh, in uh, 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 many phenomena that we observe with this electromagnetic radiations so coming to the wave property or the wave theory uh, this wave theory was basically uh, uh, an explanation where in which uh, they thought uh, that the electromagnetic radiations were uh, behaving as a waves and as the name implies the electromagnetic radiation is an alternating uh, electric and associated magnetic force field you can see there is an electric this is an electric force field which is alternating with the magnetic force field uh, in space thus uh, this electromagnetic wave has the electric as well as the magnetic component which are happening to be uh, perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation so if you see uh, this particular image here i have uh, three axes one is the x axis uh, the other one is y axis and the other one is the z axis so uh, this is a vector uh, representation of electromagnetic radiations moving along uh, the x axis i mean to say in this particular direction the electric uh, field varies in the direction of y axis i mean to say this electric force field is varying uh, along the direction of y axis whereas uh, uh, the magnetic force field is uh, varying in the direction of z axis so it is the alternating force field uh, which is the electric force field and the magnetic force field which are alternating to each other in the direct uh, like perpendicular to each other and they are traveling in the direction uh, i mean to say in this particular x axis uh, so this uh, is the explanation that was put forward uh, by the wave theory wherein which the electromagnetic radiation was believed to have the wave nature and this wave nature uh, explanation of this uh, wave nature gave uh, 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 gave an explanation or given justification to several different uh, definitions wherein which we have a wavelength frequency velocity wave number and the amplitude just because of this uh, wave theory and we will go through these definitions individually one by one before uh, we go through those definitions uh, i would like to bring your attention back to this uh, uh, corpuscular theory or the particular theory uh, the reason for introducing this alternative or the complementary theory was because uh there was a phenomenon called as refraction reflection or a sort of reinforcement and destructive interference that were happening with uh, electromagnetic radiations and these properties um uh, are uh, or this uh, uh, properties uh, are like refraction uh, or these phenomenon of refraction or reflection uh, are the examples of or are because of the wave theories but the wave nature of the electromagnetic uh, or this wave theory uh, failed to explain some of the phenomena like the photoelectric effect since this wave theory failed to explain uh, the phenomenon of uh, photoelectric effect they proposed the complementary complementary theory called as corpuscular theory uh, in order to explain uh, the photoelectric effect and they assumed that the electromagnetic radiation consisted a stream of discrete packets of energy we call them as uh, photons or quanta and these uh, packets of energy uh, had a definite energy and they traveled in the direction of propagation of the radiation uh, they had a certain directions and they had some velocity in which they were traveling uh, which was equal to the velocity of light and the energy of each of these photons uh, is proportional to the frequency of the radiation and hence there was a relationship that took birth e is equal to h nu and that e is equal to h nu was a very important uh, definition that was put forward and in this particular definition e was uh, corresponding uh, to the energy of photon uh, which was uh, expressed in ergs uh, 
and the new which was corresponding to the frequency of the electromagnetic radiations which is expressed in uh, cps or cycles per second and h is the planck's uh, constant uh, which has a value of uh, 6.624 into 10 to the power uh, minus 27 arcs second or uh, joule second which is an si unit so uh, this was uh, the corpuscular theory where they considered uh, the light uh, to be in the form of uh, photons and these were traveling uh, with the speed of uh, light and uh, the intensity of uh, a beam of radiation uh, is proportional uh, to the number of photons uh, per second that are propagated in the beam so it is like the uh, uh, in velocity with which the light uh, travels but the intensity is the independent of the energy of each photon that's what they meant to be uh, or that's what they stated in corpuscular theory so one more thing about the wave theory was like uh, uh, when we saw this alternating electric and force field uh, that were happening um, uh, in this electromagnetic radiation and it was considered to be the uh, it was considered to be that the electromagnetic radiation was comprised of alternating uh, electric and magnetic force fields and these force fields were actually interacting with uh, the matters and uh, especially it was uh, the electric force field which was bringing about the electronic changes uh, in the matter and uh, in all the cases or in most cases it was the electric force field that was interacting with the matter but in one instance uh, especially in the nuclear magnetic resonance the magnetic force field was actually acting with the matter and the changes or the flip in the orientation or the spin state was because of this magnetic force field which was being experienced by a spinning proton so that, that was the applications or that was how this complementary theories uh, took uh, their shape and we consider both the theories as uh, applicable for our entire discussion uh, in this particular electromagnetic uh, uh, basics so coming to the definitions of uh, wavelength frequency velocity wave number and amplitude we'll first take up uh, the wavelength uh, so as we have mentioned the wave theory has uh, uh, given rise to all this definition and wave is always characterized by this following five important uh, characteristics so first is the wavelength and it is defined as the distance from a particular height of the wave to the next stop on the wave uh, it is as same as or it is as at the same height and going in the same direction it is represented as lambda or and is measured in terms of centimeter armstrong microns or nanometer okay it can be expressed in several different units so in short it is the distance between the two successive uh, troughs or crests i can tell uh, i can tell uh, in the electromagnetic uh, spectrum so here is an interconversion um, formula where 1 cm uh, is equal to 10 to the power 8 armstrong which is equal to 10 to the power 4 micron and which is equal to 10 to the power 7 nanometer so i request you to memorize and keep this uh, interconversion formula handy so that uh, you may encounter some questions where they may ask you to interconvert the unit of this particular wavelength and also uh, same with the different units where i have taken centimeter armstrong micron and nanometer and the corresponding uh, units uh, the corresponding interchanging units coming to the next uh, characteristic term that is frequency it is defined as the number of waves which pass through a point in one second and is denoted by symbol nu and is expressed in terms of cycles per second uh, or even in hertz so h nu uh, where i mentioned nu uh, in the formula e is equal to h nu in the corpuscular theory uh, that wavelength times this uh, frequency is nothing but the velocity or c is equal to lambda nu or we can calculate this nu by simply uh, interchanging or rearranging this equation that is c is equal to lambda nu we can calculate the frequency frequency is equal to c by lambda or the velocity divided by wavelength so frequency is like number of waves or number of waves with one trough and one crest uh, how many waves do pass at one given particular point if you uh, if you count those or if you keep an account of those 
a number of waves passing to that particular point in a given unit time then that is what we mean by frequency so next is the velocity uh, velocity is defined as the distance covered in one second by the wave it is denoted by the letter c all electromagnetic waves as i have mentioned they travel with the same velocity as that of light okay that is uh, 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second <clears throat> coming to the next definition that is wave number this is the reciprocal of wavelength that is the number of wavelengths uh, per centimeter i mean to say it is the simple reciprocal of wavelength that is 1 by lambda and it is nothing but the number of wavelengths per centimeter it is denoted by the symbol nu bar okay it is expressed as nu bar is equal to 1 by lambda okay as it is the reciprocal of wavelength it is represented as 1 by lambda coming to the amplitude uh, it is defined as the height of the crest or the depth of the trough of a wave it is denoted by a letter a it determines the intensity of that particular radiation so uh, here is an arrangement of electromagnetic radiation or speaking the continuum uh, electromagnetic radiation which we were discussing previously uh, that electromagnetic spectrum covers an immense range of wavelengths which uh, have been represented here and the arrangement of this uh, various types of electromagnetic radiation in the order of their either increasing or decreasing wavelengths or frequencies is known as electromagnetic spectrum. We call it as electromagnetic spectrum once we arrange them in, in a certain order. So, first uh, we have uh, the uh, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays and cosmic rays. So, I am trying to go in order from in an increasing order of energy uh, that is associated with this uh, electromagnetic radiations and you can see there is an uh, electromagnetic radiation of a type and there is I have represented a corresponding wavelength and its corresponding frequency. So as I said it is in the increasing order of energy radio waves are the uh, least energy uh, compared to the cosmic uh, rays which are you know, with the highest energy and the order of energy goes from radio waves microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays and cosmic rays. So I was talking about this E is equal to H nu when I was discussing the corpuscular theory and uh, this uh, E is equal to H nu, the, uh, the energy associated with the, uh, the regions of electromagnetic radiation are related to the wavelength and frequency by this particular equation that is E is equal to H nu okay and where A is uh, the energy of radiation in joules per second, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it is, is uh, uh, the energy of photons in ergs or in joules uh, and h is the Planck's constant which has certain value uh, and uh, the frequency, velocity and the wavelength and this is how uh, the uh, nu is being replaced by c by lambda as we could see here that uh, the frequency is equal to c by lambda okay so the same thing they have replaced here the frequency term has been replaced by c by lambda so e is equal to h nu can also be written as e is equal to hc by lambda okay so we should do, uh, remember that the higher the frequency higher the energy the longer the wavelength the lower the energy okay this is a very basic thing which we should remember henceforth so longer the wavelength if, if a wavelength has a longer number then the energy usually it will be lesser and if the frequency is higher the energy associated will be quite high. So again this is a one more representation of electromagnetic uh, spectrum where I have demarcated uh, a visible region uh, in particular where we can see uh, the component colors of the white light which is visible uh, through our human eye. We can only perceive uh, this visible portion in the entire electromagnetic spectrum rather we cannot perceive with our eyes rest of these electromagnetic radiations but rather this particular portion uh, which is being shaded here is the only region which we can perceive and that is the visible light and that visible light is made up of all these component wavelengths. Coming to the process of energy absorption, uh, the mechanism of absorption of energy is different in all of these electromagnetic uh, spectrums, uh, spectrum regions it is different in ultraviolet, it is different in infrared region, it is different in nuclear magnetic resonance region so on and so forth. However, the fundamental process 
is the absorption of certain amount of energy and there is also an emission of energy on taking up of the uh, uh, on taking up of the energy uh, the matter won't keep that energy for long rather it tries to relieve that energy in the form of emissions those kind of spectra uh, uh, arising out of those uh, emission process we call it as an emission spectrum we'll come to that part uh, down in the slides the energy required for the transition from a state of lower energy to the state of higher energy is directly related to the frequency of electromagnetic radiation that causes the transition so i will take back you to the uh, uh, the same equation uh, this is the energy of the radiation is uh, directly proportional to the uh, frequency of uh, the radiation since energy is directly related to the frequency whatever energy it takes uh, to bring about the transition that is uh, proportional or directly related to the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation which brings about that particular transition that is when we say the energy has been absorbed though and coming to the spectral distribution of radiant energy as i have mentioned uh, it is again uh, the distribution of the radiant energy in, in certain order and uh, now we have represented in the form of waves cycles per centimeter i would like to take back uh, through this electromagnetic uh, spectrum chart uh, so though uh, it looks very simple uh, it is not that simple in in the uh, in in fact because these regions are so wide they they cannot be accounted in one single scale so what would they do is they either they take the logarithmic scale or they simply cut off the scale so that they they fit each of this uh, individual electromagnetic uh, re uh, radiation so that uh, can represent all these in one particular uh, chart so as i mentioned uh, logarithm scale uh, is usually employed in the representation and uh, uh, the divisions between these uh, different spectral regions are just a matter of uh, convenience and are made partly to indicate the origin of radiations and partly for experimental reasons so that is uh, 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 a diffuse overlap uh, we see uh, uh, arbitrary and diffuse uh, overlapping region you can see so the x-ray is quite overlapped with gamma and ultraviolet uh, regions so similarly with the visible uh, similarly with the infrared these regions are not perfectly demarked rather they are bit overlapped uh, one on the other Coming to the properties uh, associated with this uh, electromagnetic spectrum and their applications and how they interact with a given matter. Uh, it is the same chart, uh, I have written it once again. Uh, I'll be uh, highlighting the type of radiation and the type of spectroscopy we study based on the kind of radiation and what are the transitions these radiations bring upon uh, in the matter. If you are speaking about the gamma rays, uh, the type of spectroscopy we deal with is a gamma ray emission and the kind of change they bring in matter are at nuclear levels and these are the highest energy uh, uh, radiations which bring about the changes in the nuclear la uh, nuclear la level next is the x-ray uh, we call it as x-ray absorption emission uh, spectroscopy where the electronic uh, the electrons in the innermost shells are affected by this kind of radiations and coming to the ultraviolet or the UV absorption uh, spectroscopy where there is an absorption of ultraviolet radiations so that the electrons in the outermost shell they respond and they take up the energy and they go to the excited states we call it as ultraviolet spectroscopy and that is same with the visible infrared uh, are a bit uh, lesser uh, in energy and they bring about uh, they can only afford about the molecular vibrations they cannot afford electronic or nuclear changes because they are very weak they bring about molecular rotations and microwave radiations they, that's kind of spectroscopic technique we call it as microwave absorption and they bring about uh, uh, they just bring about the change uh, the, they can change the spin uh, in the um, uh, nuclear level and that is same with the radio frequency radiation and we call this as nuclear magnetic radiations which is an important concept uh, we study in this spectroscopy and both they affect the spin states uh, at the nuclear level coming to divisions in spectroscopy spectroscopy is conveniently divided into two broad classes one is absorption spectroscopy and emission spectroscopy and before to uh, before we go into this broad divisions of uh, spectroscopy um, we will understand uh, we will also understand the, the, uh, the study of spectroscopy uh, which is can also be carried out under the 
two different headings as uh, atomic spectroscopy and uh, molecular spectroscopy and the most uh, widely uh, performed uh, spectroscopy is the molecular spectroscopy and we'll first understand what is the difference between the atomic uh, spectroscopy and molecular spectroscopy before we actually jump into this divisions in spectroscopy so coming to atomic spectroscopy uh, uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, spectroscopic technique which deals with the interaction of electromagnetic radiations uh, with atoms which are most commonly in the lowest energy state called as the ground state so here there is an involvement or the interaction of electromagnetic radiations uh, with the atoms which are mostly in the lowest energy state uh, or we call it as the ground state and that is what we call it as atomic uh, spectroscopy and in this atomic uh, spectroscopy there is a transition of electrons uh, from one electronic energy level to the other and this electronic uh, absorption uh, of uh, or this absorption of electromagnetic uh, radiations or the absorption of electromagnetic radiations can uh, result um, can only occur or can only happen only if the photon has an energy uh, which is equal to uh, the difference or which is equal to the uh, energy difference between the two energy levels so e is equal to h nu uh, equation takes the other form which we call it as the delta e is equal to h nu where delta e is the difference between the two quantum energy levels and the, uh, uh, that delta e is equal to h nu h uh, is the planck's constant and the nu is the frequency of the photon which is bringing about uh, uh, which is uh, capable of bringing about the excitation of an electron from the ground state to the excited state so whenever the electron jumps from the ground state to the excited state we call that as an absorption process where that results into an electronic excitation and coming to the applications of this electronic spectroscopy which i was talking in the field of chemistry uh, it is very little uh, so it is rather uh, the molecular spectroscopy which is uh, broadly or main uh, mainly applied into into the uh, chemical analysis and this molecular spectroscopy uh, it deals with uh, the interaction of electromagnetic radiations with the molecules previously in the atomic spectroscopy it was the interaction of electromagnetic radiations with the atoms which are mostly in the lowest energy state called as ground state but here in the molecular spectroscopy uh, it is the interaction of electromagnetic radiations with the molecules and this interaction results in the transition between the rotational and vibrational energy levels in addition to the electronic transitions so in the atomic spectroscopy it was uh, the atoms that were involved and it was bringing about the excitation of electrons in the atomic uh, spectroscopy whereas in the molecular spectroscopy it was the involvement of molecules and these molecules were uh, interacting with the electromagnetic radiations that resulted in the transitions between the various energy levels uh, between the rotational and vibrational energy levels in addition to the electronic energy level and as a result the spectra or the kind of spectra uh, is a bit complicated because there is a lot of uh, energy levels like uh, rotational, vibrational uh, and um, translational, rotational, vibrational and electronic energy levels are involved. The kind of spectra which we get out of this molecular spectroscopy is quite complicated than of uh, the atomic uh, uh, spectra atomic spectra. So uh, I, have, I will be making a separate video for this uh, molecular energies where you will understand uh, how the molecular spectroscopy originally uh, takes its birth uh, which uh, has the various molecular energy levels like translational rotational vibrational and electronic energy levels uh, the, that video will be shared sh shortly after this particular video so uh, after that uh, atomic spectroscopy and molecular spectroscopy now we will be uh, coming to the divisions uh, which are conveniently divided into two types uh, which is the absorption spectroscopy and the emission spectroscopy coming to the absorption spectroscopy in absorption spectroscopy uh, the energy carried by a photon is absorbed by the analyte prompting uh, sorry promoting the analyte from the lower energy state to the higher energy or the excited state so here uh, in this absorption spectroscopy the energy carried by a photon is absorbed uh, by the analyte suppose there is an analyte and that analyte or the matter is exposed to an electromagnetic radiation uh, 
and that electromagnetic radiation is falling on the matter and that energy is taken up by an electron which is in the ground state. The energy taken up by this electron in the ground state, depending on the kind or the amount of energy that the electron takes, it either jumps to the next energy level which is E1 or it may even jump to E2. And this jump in the electronic energy levels is uh, the, uh, dependent on the amount of uh, energy it takes up. For example, jump from E0 to E1 requires lesser energy whereas jump from E0 to E2 takes up more energy. So this is what I was discussing in the previous that is uh, delta E is equal to H nu. Delta E is the difference between these energy level that is E1 minus E0 the difference which we get we call that as the delta E and in order to bring about the electronic excitation the electron should jump from or it should cover this particular distance that is it should jump from E0 to E1 and depending on that particular difference in the energy uh, delta E is equal to H nu. H is a Planck's constant which is a constant value and nu is the frequency. Depending on this energy difference if this energy difference matches with the particular frequency of the electromagnetic radiation then it takes up the energy we call that as an absorption process and the whole technique we call it as an absorption spectroscopy. So the intensity uh, of the photons passing through a sample uh, containing the analyte is attenuated because of absorption. The measurement of this attenuation which we call as absorbance serves as our signal. So basically we are uh, much concerned with this particular signal we call this as absorbance. So absorbance is that intensity of the photons of which we which after passing through a sample which is containing an analyte uh, that is attenuated the intensity of the photon which is uh, being passed through a sample containing vessel it is attenuated because of the absorption process and this absorption process is because of the analyte that is present in the vessel. So absorption only occurs when the photon's energy matches the difference in the energy that is delta E between the two energy levels. As I have mentioned the that particular frequency only absorbs when the delta E is matching to that particular frequency. A plot of absorbance as a function of the photon's energy is called as an absorption spectrum. That is a basic uh, definition for this absorption spectrum. It is a simple plot of absorbance as a function of photon's energy. We call it as uh, absorption spectrum. Coming to the emission spectrum, in emission spectroscopy, emission of uh, photon occurs when a light uh, sorry, when an analyte is in a higher energy state returns to a lower energy state. So basically it is the reversal of the previous absorption process here in uh, the photon uh, after taking up the energy it, it would have gone in the excited state but it should come back uh, in order to relieve the excess energy it should come back to the ground state and during this process of return journey uh, the energy is liberated which we call it as an emission spectroscopy and it liberates the, this particular electron while coming from E1 to E0 it liberates the same amount of energy which it had previously taken up to go from E0 to E1. So the higher energy state can be achieved in either two ways including the thermal uh, energy or the radiant energy of the photon or by chemical reaction. We can excite this uh, uh, exa uh, electron either so uh, we can excite the electrons as I said uh, by thermal sources, by the radiation energy or by chemical. There are several ways in order to excite the electrons from ground to excited state. And the emission uh, following an absorption of a photon is also called as photoluminescence and that following a chemical re reaction is called as chemiluminescence. Coming to the basic components of a spectroscopic instrument uh, instrumentation. So we have uh, these four uh, different uh, basic components in any spectroscopic instrument. The first is the source of energy. The second one is the wavelength selector or we also call it as a monochromator. Uh, and the third one is the very important part called as detectors. And the fourth one are called as signal processors. So the sources of energy uh, are the one which will generate a corresponding or the required or the desired electromagnetic radiation so that that is in particular used uh, for a particular sample or a particular observation. The wavelength selection, uh, it, it is just to narrow down the wavelengths so that we can end up with, uh, we can exclude the overlapping regions uh, as I have mentioned, uh, uh, to exclude the overlapping regions and to, uh, and to select only the very uh, precise narrow range of uh, wavelengths, uh, we use this uh, wavelength selectors.
and the sensitivity usually of the instrument depends on the wavelength selectors and the detectors. And detectors are the one which measure the signal which has been, um, which is coming out of the sample cell. These detectors are the one which will pursue those signals and they will uh, convert those signals, uh, chemical changes into some electronic uh, uh, signals where the signal processors, they that is uh, the job of signal processors where uh, the electrical uh, energy is put into a very uh, convenient form so that we can uh, observe and analyze the things. Coming to the sources of energy, uh, in, in absorption and scattering spectroscopy, this energy is supplied by photons and emission, uh, emission and luminescence spectroscopy, we use thermal uh, uh, or the radiant or the chemical energy to promote an, a light to a less stable higher energy state. So, uh, the sources are of uh, two different types uh, and any electromagnetic uh, source must provide an output that is both intense and stable in the desired wavelength region of electromagnetic spectrum. So, we have two different uh, sources of electromagnetic radiations. One is the continuum source, the other one is the line source. Continuum source, it emits the radiations over a wide range of wavelengths which is relatively smooth variations in intensity as a function of wavelength. Whereas the line sources, they emit radiations at a very few selected wavelength regions which are narrow wavelength ranges and these line sources are very uh, emitting uh, the energy in a very fixed wavelength regions whereas the continuum sources, they work over the wide wavelength regions. Coming to uh, the typical uh, emission spectrum uh, which is uh, a from a continuum source and which is the other one is from the line source. The continuum sources will provide the almost all of the wavelength regions as you can see. If they provide uh, the energies which are corresponding to the all of the wavelengths uh, that are present in the given electromagnetic uh, region. Whereas the line sources, they give the wavelengths at only a particular wavelength regions uh, rather than at all the wavelength regions. So, this is the difference between the continuum source and the line source. Coming to the sources of uh, thermal, uh, thermal energy, we have, we use thermal energy as the source of excitation of electrons, also the chemical sources. Uh, the thermal sources, we use flame and plasma sources which work at uh, different temperatures and coming to the chemical sources, chemical sources are like a sort of exo exothermic reactions uh, which serve as a source of energy. In chemiluminescence, the analyte is raised to higher energy state by means of chemical reaction, emitting characteristic radiations which uh, when it returns to the lower energy state. So, when the chemical reaction is resulting from a biological or enzymatic system, the emission we call it as bioluminescence. So, these are some of the common electromagnetic radiation sources uh, like H2, D2 lamp, tungsten lamp, xenon arc, mass glower, glow bar, nichrome wire, halo cathode lamp, HG vapor lamp. All of these sources have uh, one particular wavelength region where they produce either a continuum uh, or a line source and coming to its uh, applications where we use them in either in UV uh, spectroscopy or ultraviolet visible spectroscopy or in the fluorescence spectroscopy or in the IR or in the atomic on the molecular uh, fluorescence or atomic or molecular absorption fluorescence and scattering. So, these are the different sources of radiations what we commonly employ and these are the wavelength regions where they function. And this is the usefulness of all these uh, wavelength sources. Coming to the wavelength selection, if more than one component in the sample contributes uh, to the absorption of radiation, then quantitative analysis becomes a bit impossible and attempts should be made to narrow uh, the wavelength region of the visible light passing through the sample. So, th this means that if there is more than one component in the system which is contributing for the absorption of the radiation, then uh, it is it becomes quite difficult uh, uh, to selectively uh, uh, pass on or selectively uh, make one component to show the absorption. So, why, what we usually try to do is we will try to narrow down the wavelength range so that one particular component takes up the radiation once and the other component takes up the wavelength at once. And whenever they take a particular wavelength uh, for a particular molecule, the wavelength at which they takes or they absorb 
uh, at maximum is different and that is a very unique character of each of the sample or the molecule um, that exists every molecule absorbs uh, one uh, absorbs uh, at one particular wavelength or there is a maximum absorption at one particular wavelength and there are no two compounds having same absorption maxima so that is a very uniqueness uh, in property which we employ and for that reason we we narrow down the wavelength in order to check what analyte absorbs at what wavelength and for this reason as i said we try to select a single wavelength where the analyte is only absorbing the species and unfortunately we cannot isolate a single wavelength of the radiation from the continuum source instead what we can do is we can use a something called as a wavelength selector uh, which passes a narrow band of uh, radiation uh, characterized by a nominal wavelength an effective bandwidth and a maximum throughput of the radiation so uh, we cannot uh, pinpointly produce one particular wavelength from a continuum source as i have mentioned continuum source it keeps on producing uh, all the radiations simultaneously and we cannot produce one particular uh, radiation of a particular wavelength uh, uh, so what we employ is we employ something called as a wavelength selector which allows to select one particular nominal wavelength what we call as we can select one nominal wavelength uh, with the effective bandwidth effective bandwidth i mean to say uh, the width of the band of the radiation that is passing through the wavelength selector which is measured at half a distance from here till here so this effective bandwidth should be as less as possible so that there is no overlapping of the wavelengths from the neighboring portions so this we call it as uh, the nominal wavelength which is the wavelength uh, selector is set to pass so uh, that is the use of the wavelength selectors and this wavelength selection uh, selector should have some ideal properties it should have high throughput of radiations or it should produce high throughput of radiations and it should have the narrow effective bandwidth this effective bandwidth should be as narrow as possible so the high throughput of radiation uh, because of more photons pass through the wavelength selector giving a stronger signal less background noise so that is uh, we need uh, a very high intense uh, uh, wavelength of radiation uh, passing through this wavelength selector uh, with a very little background noise that is what we call as high throughput of radiation and narrow effective bandwidth uh, that usually uh, uh, provides a higher resolution with uh, spectral features separated by more than twice the effective bandwidth being resolved generally uh, these two properties of wavelength selectors are in a position conditions favoring the high throughput uh, usually provide less uh, resolution and decreasing the effective bandwidth will improve the uh, resolution but at the cost of noise uh, in the background so for qualitative analysis uh, resolution is generally more important than the throughput of radiation uh, thus smaller effective bandwidths are desirable in qualitative analysis whereas in quantitative analysis a high throughput of radiation is usually desirable so this is uh, the representation where i have four images uh, where in which uh, they depict the effect of monochromator slit width on the noise and the resolution of the ultraviolet absorption spectrum of benzene uh, the slit width uh, slit is something which allows the amount of light uh, to pass through the slit width increases from spectrum a to spectrum uh, d basically and uh, 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 the a uh, to d as such with the effective band passes a is having effective band pass of uh, 0.25 nanometer and d is having 1 nanometer 2 is having uh, 2 nanometer and uh, d is having 4 nanometer i'm sorry c is having 2 nanometer and d is having 4 nanometer so you can see there is a lot of uh, the disturbance uh, at 0.25 nanometer band pass so we usually resort for uh the kind of spectra yeah this looks much better as we can see uh a much detail here in this c uh, that is two would be the effective much better effective band pass for this particular sample so coming to the wavelength selectors uh, as i have mentioned we have uh, some different types of wavelength selectors like filters monochromators and interferometers filters uh, are the devices which allow uh, light of desired wavelength to pass but absorbs light of other wavelength wholly or entirely or partially so basically filters uh, they let in uh, 
only the desired wavelength and block the undesired wavelengths and that is how these filters work and there are two types absorption filters and interference filters absorption filters they work by selectively absorbing the radiations from a narrow region of the electromagnetic spectrum for example pur purple filter uh, for example removes the complementary color i mean to say this purple filter if you select it removes the complementary color which is green and the region the wavelength region for green is 500 to 560 nanometer commercially available absorption filters provide effective band pass of 30 to 250 nanometer and the maximum throughput for the smallest effective band pass however may be only 10 percent of the source emission intensity over the range of wavelengths coming to the interference filters these are more expensive than the absorption filters but have narrower effective band uh, bandwidth typically 10 to 20 nanometer you can see the effective bandwidth is very very little when compared to this which have 32 to 50 nanometer so it is better to have interference filters because the effective band pass uh, is 10 to 20 nanometer and high throughput uh, which is as minimum as 40 percent so this is an interference filter when a ray of light uh, uh, is incident upon the interference filter a part of the light reflects back whereas the remaining light is transmitted here you can see when uh, a particular wavelength light is passed through this interference filter some of the light is uh, uh, is passing through uh, the surface whereas some of it is reflecting back uh, or transmitting back a part of the incident light is reflected repeatedly that uh, reflection or uh, a part of light which is uh, coming back uh, is happening repeatedly um, by the metal layer there is a, a semi reflective layer and the dielectric layer and there is a metal layer here and this happens at the metal layer but at exact reflection um, uh, some is transmitted onwards so the several ongoing radi uh, rays undergo constructive interference and those wavelengths which are exactly even multiples of uh, the distance separating uh, the two for other wavelengths the beams undergo destructive interference and thus no energy is passed so it is basically uh, a constructive interference and the destructive interference which is happening at this particular interface only one particular wavelengths are let out whereas the other undesired wavelengths uh, go or uh, uh, they extinguish as a destructive interference leaving behind the wavelengths which are uh, not needed so this is why uh, this is how the interference work interference filter works and by varying the distance between the filters uh, the wavelength uh, the desirable wavelength uh, will be uh, modified and the desirable wavelength is achieved so coming to the same interference filter here uh, where we can see an insulating layer uh, where in which there is a reflection reflected light and the one which is the transmitted light is the one which we are looking for and this is the filter wheel uh, where we assemble the filters in somewhat this way coming to the limitations of these filters they do not allow for a continuous selection of wavelength if measurements need to be made at two wave wavelengths then the filter must be changed in between measurements i mean to say if you are working at two different wavelengths uh, you, you are supposed to change the filters uh, we cannot take one filter and work over the uh, wide wavelength region the filters are uh, available for only selected nominal ranges of wavelength i mean to say these filters will not or will work only for a nominal wavelength region or for a certain fixed wavelength region and we cannot use them for the entire wavelength region the next wavelength selector uh, would be uh, the monochromators these are more advantageous uh, they provide continuous variations in the wavelength uh, they have a definite wavelength and they convert polychromatic light into a monochromatic when we say polychromatic here in spectroscopy uh, this is the wavelength of light which is made up of several different uh, uh, frequencies or wavelengths uh, when i call it as a monochromatic light it is the light which is made up of one particular wavelength when i call it as polychromatic it is a light which is made up of multiple uh, wavelengths so there are two different types of monochromators called as graters and prisms uh, the gratings 
are the very important components and this typical grating uh, is represented here uh, the typical uh, grating monochromator with inset showing the dispersion of radiation by the diffraction grating so we call this as a diffraction surface where when a plane light is hitting this uh, uh, serrated uh, surface uh, this uh, plane light gets diffracted uh, into the component wavelengths and when this happens at all the serrated surfaces what we have is what we end up having is uh, a band of wavelengths like lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 so we have a band of wavelengths from one particular radiation we split that radiation into the band of wavelengths and that is the job of this um, uh, gratings uh, and this is very important uh, as uh, this grating uh, is uh, uh, a very crucial component in any instrument as it allows an uh, individual band of wavelength to pass through. So what they do is they take a, a metal surface, they make some grooves and those grooves are reflected or sparkled with aluminum powder which is highly reflective and they make the surface in such a way or they arrange this surface in such a way that whenever there is an incident or light coming and hitting the surface, this surface diffracts the lights into its component bands. Here you can see the single light is split into the bands of wavelengths. So the next and the last uh, wavelength selector is the interferometer, uh, a device that allows all the wavelengths of light to be measured simultaneously eliminating the need of wavelength selector. So interferometers uh, are sort of devices which will allow all the wavelengths of light to be measured simultaneously. So if you are able to measure all the wavelength of lights simultaneously, then we may not need any wavelength selector. So interfere, uh, interferometers, they eliminate the job of wavelength selectors. So instead of uh, filtering or dispersing the electromagnetic radiation, an interferometer simultaneously allow the sources of all the wavelengths to reach the detector. So uh, we are not using any wavelength selectors here. The interferometers will let in all the wavelengths which is coming from the source and they are made to fall on the sample. So radiation uh, from the source is focused on a beam splitter. So if this is the source of radiation, that source of radiation is focused on the beam splitter that transmit half of the radiation to a fixed mirror. Half of the radiations are transferred to a fixed mirror and half of the radiations, uh, while uh, the half of the radiations are reflected uh, to the movable mir mirror. The radiation uh, combines at the wavelength, uh, combines at the beam splitter. I mean to say when they hit these mirrors, the radiations uh, are reflected back from both these mirrors one is fixed and the other one is moving. Uh, they, uh, the, the returning radiations, they combine at the beam splitter where the constructive and destructive uh, interference determines uh, for each of the wavelength the intensity of the light reaching the detector. I mean to say the constructive interference and the destructive interference uh, process is carried out by moving these mirrors so that if there is a destructive interference, th those wavelengths will be eliminated and if there is a constructive interference, those wavelengths will be let into the sample. So as the moving mirror changes the position, the wavelength of the light uh, experiencing maximum constructive interference and the maximum destructive interference also changes. The signal at the detector shows intensity as a function of moving mirror's position expressed in unit of distance or time. This results in an interferogram uh, or a time domain spectrum. And the time domain spectrum is mathematically converted to a frequency domain spectrum by a process called as Fourier transformation. Uh, and uh, this uh, entire process uh, is called as the... Coming to the... Uh, coming to the... Uh, okay. Uh, this kind of spectra, they are called as a Fourier transformed spectra. So, uh, coming to the next component, uh, we call it as uh, detectors and... Uh, transducer is a component that uh, converts a chemical or physical property such as pH, photon intensity to an easily measured electrical signal such as voltage or current. So modern instruments uh, use sensitive transducers to convert a signal consisting of photon into easily measured electric signal. So uh, the, that is the job of transducers where a chemical or a physical property is converted to electric signals. So we have different types of uh, transducers, one is photon, the other one is thermal transducers. The photon transducers are like several like phototube, photomultiplier tube, 
silicon photo tube, photoconductor, photovoltaic cell, etc. Uh, we will study these photon transducers in detail whenever we come across in the respective chapters. And these are the thermal transducers which are very much employed in IR spectroscopy. Uh, we will uh, go to, uh, we will go in detail about these thermal transducers when we take up the IR uh, spectroscopic discussions. So, uh, when there is uh, a photon uh, transducer, these are the different photon transducers. When there is a thermal transducer, we have thermocouple, thermistor, pneumatic and pyroelectric. And these are the wavelength regions which they operate at and this is one of the uh, detectors. The last component is the signal processor. Signal processor is a component where uh, the electrical signal generated by the transducer is sent to the signal processor where it is displayed in a more convenient way uh, where we can uh, see what is happening. So example of uh, signal processors include analog or digital meters, recorders and computers equipped with digital acquisition boards. And the signal processors also may be used to calibrate the detector's response sometimes and to amplify the signal from the detector and also to remove the noise by filtering or to mathem mathematically transform the given signal. So this was, uh, this was about the basic introduction of electromagnetic spectrum uh, uh, and this is a, a serious prerequisite which one, sh uh, who, uh, one should know uh, before we go on for the spectroscopic discussions. Thank you, Vernon.